Welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers podcast, the podcast that's quite willing to show you a picture of its privates. This week on Heart and Hand, the away day hoodoo ends at Hamilton. So welcome to Heart and Hand Rangers Podcast. My name is David Edgar. I am your host and I'm joined this week by some of the best guests I could possibly get my hands on and Cami. So first of all, hello Cami. Good afternoon, David. Good afternoon. And bringing up the quality, it's Mr Alex Staff. Good afternoon, gentlemen. We good? We're not too bad. Uh, Cami, you're here. Um, Kyle Lafferty's junk is uh, something that's been in your thoughts many a time over the years. And uh, you weren't in any way involved in this, were you? No, but I'd like to thank my uh, 17-year-old sister for um, lending me her Snapchat to achieve my dreams. (laughs) Uh, 22-year-old lady, for those of you who may not know, uh, ladies probably being a little... uh, Anyway, uh, she uh, got pictures, she claims, of Kyle Lafferty's um, downstairs... Uh, apparently that's what the young folks do these days they take pictures uh, and for some reason it's considered alluring or erotic I don't know I mean don't know about you lads but while I'm quite proud of mine and you know it does its job but uh, I've never thought do you know what's going to tip the balance with this girl if I go up and show her a photograph of my penis it's never occurred to me but apparently Alex that's what the young folks do today yeah I bet you Nuno Capuccio must look back now in real (laughs) Real dismay at the fact that these options weren't available to him back in the day. <laughs> he was a pioneer, um, if you will. He, yeah, he exactly. was like one of the, he was like the flat, the Frank Lloyd Wright of uh, of, of 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 getting your your tadger out. Unsolicited dick pictures. Um, yes, uh, yeah. There's that side of them as well, isn't it? Where you do wonder. I mean, as you say, love the wee man and all that. But he's an ugly wee bastard. There's just no other He's functional. Him, so. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what I mean. He he has a purpose and he does it. He's like feet. Um, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Are you talking, wait a minute. Are, are you talking about your junkie, your son? Sorry, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> I should yeah. certainly hope he wouldn't stick his son in some of the predicaments he stuck his lad I just, over the I, years. I just love a conversation to start of. Oh, I was talking to the wee man at the weekend and give him a bit of a pet talk and all that kind of thing. <laughs> and then at some point, it then becomes obvious that you're actually talking about your PT rather than your, you know, your offspring. Uh, I might yeah. try that. I might have a son then. Try that some so let's not let's not uh, throw that idea out the window. Yeah, let, let's not confuse the issue. But look, in all seriousness, Cammy, coming hot on the heels of the whole Northern Irish farrago, which by the club statement would indicate that they thought Kyle was sort of bang to rights on it. This is, you know, they're not sacking offences or anything close to it. I don't think. But we had been told he'd growing up. He's not a daft boy anymore. He's a 30-year-old man. He's married with a kid. And he's got to wrap this shite. This is his last go at the big the big city, I think. Do you know, the, the, the thing that occurs to me is he has to talk to Stephen Gerrard about this. I know. He'll and f- and, and, and uh, that, that just gives me the absolute fear. Mm. So it'd be like, I mean, going in and explaining it to, to Sir Walter. You, there's no excuse for this. It's the dumbest thing that you can possibly do. Um, amazed that you know he, he's he's fallen victim for this. I don't. I, I know we kind of talked about this previously, but I, I don't blame the media for this per se. It's entirely his own fault. The Northern Ireland thing is just what it is. All right, I'm not getting into the dredges of international football. This is just a really really stupid thing to do. And um, I mean, hopefully, hopefully learns a lesson from it. Uh, but no, this is not this is not the guy that we wanted to to come back to Rangers and the behaviour we wanted to to see displayed. Um, but if it does mean that his wife becomes available, <laughs> then shoulder to cry on. Is, yes, there is. Yes, I will come and talk to her and obviously explain why he was so silly and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, who knows what she might get out the back of it. Probably absolutely nothing because she wouldn't even give me the time of day. But no, one well, can dream. No, absolutely. Uh, to any young folks listening, listen. Um, most girls don't want a picture of your privates, and the ones that do aren't the type you should be having anything to do with their privates. So, we word of advice, uh, and and that goes for Kyle as well. Just you know, 
uh, screw the nut. Uh, I don't think you've got, as as Cammy alluded to, the most forgiving of managers for this sort of unpleasantness. So let's move on to the football, gentlemen. Alex, we went to the CBD Stadium, which I believe is actually named after cannabis oil. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. Outstanding. Um, Scottish football, folks. I yeah, thought the Tony yeah. Macaroni arena had, had peaked it, but... Uh, no, but th- we've got the CBD This arena. one... Um, I think it's very sane. Nicola Cathy should maybe have been trying out some stuff before we started again. Not his best performance, yes. We'll come to that. Rangers made some changes, obviously, with a lot of games coming up the next couple of months or so. And uh, with the manager maybe looking to, to use his squad, we saw Nico Katic came back in at the side, Andy Halliday in at left back, Borna Barisic, of course, is, is still injured, and John Flanagan isn't risked ideally on plastic pitches. Um, into midfield came Jordan Rossiter which was great to see he made his first start of the season and uh, we started slowly Cami, and worryingly slowly because I think we all hoped that <clears throat> that we wouldn't see Livingston again and we saw quite close to that almost sleepy performance again in the first half David, I live near Livingston, and I don't want to see Livingston again. <laughs> um, no, you're right, and I think being the, the 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 ever pragmatist and looking at how we could try and set up, I would have taken you know a, a, a one nil scoreline, you know, quite comfortably. I know that several among us were, you know, that will hand them a doing and blah 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 and, and and all the rest of it. But when you're watching the game. You just kind of got that feeling of I don't know if these players really believe that they can do that, and um, it was a poor start. I think Hamilton rightly were capitalising on what away form has looked like, um, and a kind of reverse scenario, if you will, of how teams used to come at us at Ibrox last season. Um, it was a kind of case of well, we've got nothing to fear here, so we can play our game and let them worry about theirs, um, and. Uh, yeah, it was a it was a a little bit faltering, and I think most people started to get kind of on the back of the players in terms of what was happening at that point, and and thinking that we should have been doing better by that stage because the performance was lacklustre, I think, to begin with. Alex, I'm intrigued by tempo in football and what you do to control it and what you do to alter it and to vary it, and. I think one of the things that we have said is that when Rangers play to a tempo, that thrilling first 40 minutes against Hearts is, is of course, a brilliant a brilliant example of it. They look, I think, dynamite at times, really. We look sensational when we do that. And the away performances, with probably the exception of Aberdeen, although that was a unique set of circumstances, hopefully, uh, that we haven't really done that in away games and we've looked off the pace, sluggish and slow in possession what is it is it a mentality thing is it perhaps players being a little bit spooked by the pitch by the result is it a skill that maybe we just don't have someone who is good at that I mean the best not a popular opinion but the best player I ever saw uh, for being able to do it was Roy Keane at Manchester United who if the game needed slowed he slowed it if it needed quickened he quickened it and his team responded with him do we just maybe lack that type of player or is there something deeper seated to it I think there's a mixture of things uh, mentality um, and confidence get a role that they win there uh, by mentality I just mean I think they play it a bit safer away from home at the moment and even with the shackles slightly off you know we picked a, a strong team we picked you know kept the players wide kept Kent and Candice wide asked them to overload in the same side sometimes all the things that we do at home they were still there was still a bit of playing safe there was a lot of passes back the way and side the way uh, sideways sorry and that just it slowed things down tactically Hamilton done exactly the same as Livingston and that when they were out of possession they let our two centre halves have the ball for as long as they wanted and as, as against Livingston Connor Goldson and this time it was Cattage in the Livingston game it was Warrell were taking far too many touches it was slowing everything down it was making it really difficult for players to find space players like Candace and Kent are getting the ball when they're standing still mm-hmm. rather than when they're on the move which then means that if they want to keep possession they like have to cut inside and take the easy pass uh, so all of that was all combining and it just it was all too safe and it 
in some respects, it gets even worse when you go 1-0 up. If the other team are happy just to sit on that window goal deficit until the last 15 minutes, it's, it's very, very difficult for teams to, to drag themselves out of it. We've done it to bigger teams in the past. Walter was an expert at setting us up that way uh, and done it in European matches. Just let other teams have loads of the ball in non-dangerous areas. Uh, and we're seeing it happening to us a few times this season now. I'd even say at home in the UFA game, for example, they just sat, they camped in their own 18-yard box, and we never really looked that sharp. And at the moment, I think I think it's a slight confidence thing. I think it's a bravery thing, actually. Some of the players just aren't quite sure of themselves, but a bit too worried about making mistakes in that sort of match, where we really need guys who are just going to, you know, maybe, maybe play... Shite and winning is exactly what a squad needed. Mm, that was something that you you touched upon before, and when the goal came, it was real quality. And again, it was not in keeping with what we'd seen. Hamilton did venture slightly more out. Uh, our boy Lasana Kulabali he didn't have a great game in all fairness, uh, but he he did make a tackle, win the ball, turned it quickly to Alfredo Morelos, who played a superb through ball. I mean, I thought it was good at the time, but when we watched it back, it was. Are just perfect curling into the path of the streaking uh, right in a good way Ryan Kent who just outpaced his defender keeper came out and I think made his mind up for it but it was still a hell of a first time finish Cammy. and if I was going to send a picture of my pink purse to anyone at the moment it would be to Ryan Kent I'm loving this guy yeah it was a it was a I think the through ball from the loss is inch perfect um I'm not taking away from Kent's finish because it was uh, very, very good. However, the keeper, I feel, helps him quite a bit by committing early. Uh, it was uh, the lad Penny yeah. who helped us out tremendously later on in the game. Who we'll was come to him. Trying to backtrack. Yeah, we'll yeah to who him. was obviously trying to trying to get to Kent. Uh, Kent had him on toast by this stage, and I think the keeper was then just like, "Well, I've I've got to commit commits." Um, and Still a hell of a, a finish, finish though First time listen, oh, no, listen, no, listen, absolutely absolutely. It was a brilliant, brilliant finish um, The good thing about that is what forces Kent to make up his mind And, it, and he makes absolutely the, 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 the right decision And great bit of skill To just lift it over his over the keeper's right shoulder And yeah, just just a great finish um, the, the, the ball from Morelos though It gets better every single time you see it In my opinion, I think the, the fact that it's got a little bit of curl on yeah, it as well, yeah. just beautifully played into to Ken's path. Um, it comes back to that, you know, if you're sending pictures to Ken, then I'll send pictures to Morelos. He probably doesn't, you know... Want them. You know, want them, but, you know, at the end of the day, you, you might just have to receive it, like, you know, most of my sexual partners. Yes. So I think that, I think from that perspective, um, it was it was a good opener for us to be able to get, because that should instill a, that confidence that Alex touched on. Um, I don't know why we don't have it uh, away from home. I, I don't understand it personally. Um, but when you see periods of play, passages of play like that, then it should instill everyone to say, listen, you know, we're a fucking good football team. So, you know, that's what we're capable of delivering. Um, but however, we'll obviously come on to what happened next. I don't think it's coincident that it was two guys who have been flying lately that combined for that goal. Um, and by far the two best pieces of skill in the, the entire first half. I admit, I thought, right, OK, piss poor performance, manager will get a hold of them at half-time, they've got the boost from the goal five minutes before half-time, and I was expecting us to, to go out and turn it on. I'd uh, said 3-0 on the, on the show, on the prediction show with Alex, and then on the morning of the game, I just did a notion for 4-1. But 4-1 looked highly unlikely, and Rangers... It couldn't get going, couldn't get anything going, Alex, at the start of the second half. And as you say, Hamilton just continued what they were. Their plan was pretty obvious. We're going to just keep this low block in place. We're going to make it difficult. And then we'll have a go in the last 10 minutes. And it was almost like Rangers said to them, OK, well, we're confident we can withstand the last 10 minutes and get away with the 1-0. And there wasn't an awful lot that happened in the in the first 25 minutes of the second half for either side. No, I mean, you had, uh, Mikel Miller had a couple of chances for them. The Jarriers drawn a good goal save out of the goalkeeper. That might not even have been in the first 25, actually. Can't quite remember the timelines uh, that way. Uh, that aside, as you say, up until that last 10 minutes, there was there was nothing really happening. Uh, when you actually look back at the game and you look at McGregor's involvement, for example, Hamilton had a lot of shots in goal, but 
Gregor didn't really have anything to do. No, they, they were shooting uh, from distance. No chance yeah. with their goal, you know. The only um, one that he say he had a save that Keatings should have done a little bit better with um, the rebound, and it was a good save oh, yeah. in the first place. And uh, yeah, after that, they they began to come more into it, and I think that this is when mentality kicks into play, guys. I thought we all thought social media suggests other Rangers fans thought. We know the script here, we know what's happening, and of course we began to sit deeper and deeper. We weren't playing that well, even defensively. Nico Katic had one of those afternoons where, you know that when you're in your work and you just know that you can't do right for doing wrong, and each mistake compounds another mistake, and he was just getting worse and worse. Uh, he had just one of those horror show days. He hasn't had them before, and I doubt very much he'll have one of them again. But he gets taken off, which you don't see that often. Joe Worrell comes on. You don't usually see centre-backs being replaced for performance issues. But then, of course, because we're all sitting thinking, we know what happens. And Hamilton scored an absolute fucking corker. And you're thinking, oh, this can't, not again, surely Rangers. Um, Alex, I love Steven Gerrard. You know that, right? I don't, I don't hide it. But I felt yesterday his use of subs and what I can only assume was his um, certainly approval of sitting in rather than going killing the game I thought he got that wrong yesterday um, I'm not sure he was approving of the way they were playing that's uh, obviously I don't know um, the use of subs I think was purely because he didn't have anybody on the bench that he trusted would be able to come on and make an impact straight away and Gresh is still working his way up to fitness we know about Sadiq um, we were, miss, were missing Lafferty uh, and maybe just thought that Midland's not the game to throw a youngster in uh, and expect him to, ch- to change what was quite abject from I, most I of the I don't know if I buy that, Alex. He chucked him in in Villarreal. Um, yeah. And he's, um, he's chucked him on before. He also, you know, it's why have a bench if it's just the 11 players that are... I, I, I don't buy that and I don't see... That any of those, well, Middleton in particular is a great example. Middleton hasn't done anything to suggest you can't throw him on with ten minutes or with twenty minutes to go against Hamilton Ackies. Maybe, but as I say, I think it was more than just one player. If you get my meaning, um, and I think that if he, he felt a bit more confidence in the bench that he had, and that it's down to kind of injury suspension issues. You know, it's not really if Gresham was fully up to speed or, or whatever. I think we'd have seen earlier changes than we did. Uh, he seems to be naturally cautious with this, where you know he wants a two or three goal lead before he'll make a sub. Uh, he's that sort of manager. I think we've seen that before, and the likes of Walter was a bit like that as well. Mm. Um, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't just you know make a. And then we had the opposite where Mark Warburton, who would make a sub in sixty minutes regardless, uh, and you know we felt it was all that cost his games at times. So. You know, there's arguments either way. I get that. I just feel as though I, I don't think he was particularly enjoying what he was seeing. I just think he felt a little bit wary of throwing someone in who might not, you know, be able to do much. I might even disrupt it further. Um, to just to come back to Katic though, that might be uh, individually as a centre half one of the worst performances we've seen in a while. And we say that as a, when, you know, as a team that had guys like Philip Senderos not long ago. You know, um, it, it was, was it, it, it was up there, but equally, um, it was so, it was so noticeable, it was so stark because it's in comparison with these other performances. Whereas if we'd seen that from a Kiernan or uh, a, a Senderos, as you say, we kind of par for the course, really, wasn't it? Whereas at least yeah. it, it, no, it stood out with him because he's normally so so reliable. Cammy, what's your yeah. take on the substitutions uh, and or lack of and or caution about them? Um, before I come on to that, I'll just I, I think just to defend Katic slightly. I think he, with everyone I know, this isn't really the point that's been made. But Katic has got enough credit in the bank that he can have an off day. And I think the question to him now will be how he recovers for that. But I personally, I'm very much pleased that we are in a position where. We don't have a Senderos or a Russell Martin. We don't have anyone that can potentially replace them. So it, it's it's it sounds daft, but actually we're in a fortunate position because where effective substitutions can be used, I, I actually think Warrell was a good substitution. That being said, I do not think that the correct thing to do yesterday was expect to get 80 minutes out of Jordan Ross in a competitive game for his first time in, since he was born. Um, 
So Rossiter, for me, should have had 60 to 70 minutes maximum. And then, you know, that would have been the substitution to make. Um, I don't want to be too harsh on the boy because, you know, obviously he has had a very difficult journey. The attempt at the tackle for Boyd was, was tired. disappointing. Yeah, he was tired. Um, yeah, and, and listen, he is tired and I get that, but then he was replaced, I think, 60 seconds later. So now you've got the point of, and, and this is, again, probably being a wee bit ultra-critical with Gerard, but my immediate thought process then is, OK, but if you take him off, it makes it look like you're taking him off because he's caused that mistake. Now, I don't think that's why he did it, but at the same point, he shouldn't have been on the park with 10 minutes to go. He, 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 you know, he, he, for me, it should have been quite clear, that irrespective of the result or where we were sitting at at that point, that he doesn't have a full 90 minutes in him. If he got 60 minutes out of him as a good run-out, then brilliant, that should have been the, the plan. But then you take him off and either you do, as we did bring on Gresda, or you know, if it was Middleton or whatever as an option, or whatever else we could do, then that's what we should have done. Um, and I think Gerard needs to really probably take a bit of a step back and think, from a game management perspective, if you are talking about squad rotation, if you're talking about bringing players in, that's when you need to seriously think about it. If he's talking about bringing in Sadiq, because he seems to have changed his tune slightly in him, then why not up the tempo, as David suggested, within games away from home? Allow the opportunity for Sadiq to come on. But right now, I just think he's if he's very, very cautious about changing anything, unless he absolutely has to. Um, and I don't think it's fair in Jordan Ross to have expected to get 80 minutes out of him and for him to... To, to come through that and be, you know, totally fresh at the, at the end of it. I think, like you say, we could have got 60 minutes out of him and then we make the substitution. So then you're just giving the boy that impression of just go out there, give him everything you've got for an hour and then I'll give you a breather because this is your first game back in a long time. So at 1-1, um, with seven minutes to go, um, substitution was made, as you say, Eris Gregg, Dart, Ross McCrory and Rangers do go for it, um, I think. An element of panic because uh, I certainly had that as like we cannot draw with Hamilton Ackies, we just can't because this is going that this now never mind being a thing, this is now going to be a big, huge monster at the end, the Ghostbusters thing sized with the away form. But uh, Rangers then move forward, start pinning Hamilton back as opposed to playing in front of them, which I think we've done for large parts of the game. We actually now start making them work, making them turn. And two penalties are given. The first one for handball, when uh, Penny leans into a cross with his arm sort of down by his side, but then comes out slightly. If he doesn't get that block with his arm, incidentally, um, Alfredo Morelos is behind him and is going to tap it in. I thought it was a penalty. Um, I'll start with you, Alex, and then we'll go to our qualified ref. Yeah, I thought that one was a penalty for the reason that you mentioned. Um, yes, the ball comes off his shoulder first, but it comes off it in such a way that if it didn't hit his arm, he wasn't in control of that. He, he, he didn't, he didn't, yeah, you know, do very well with the touch on his shoulder in the first place to stop that ball from skipping through. Now it may have went through Morelos, it may not. It's very difficult to know because it instantly hits his arm afterwards, so we don't know for for certain. But he wasn't in control of the ball until his arm hit it, and he's deliberately leaned in yeah. with his arm out. You know, that's not... We can't really say that he didn't take the chance for that. Um, so, yeah, for me, penalty, and we've said this before, at the other end of the pitch, I can remember who's getting away with one last season like that, um, with David Bates, if you remember, against Hibs, where, you know, he's, he's had one that's deflected off him and hit his hand, and it was a clear penalty that for some reason the referee never gave it. Um, we've seen other ones last season. Russell Martin was just fucking giving us an absolute demonstration of how we give away penalties, wasn't he? Mm. Uh, with handballs and stuff. So, yeah, sometimes you won't see them given, but I think the referee done quite well there, personally. Um, in a situation where some people say it's really easy to give the decision to pick team, but no. not. Not in Scotland. Well, recent history doesn't suggest it goes our way. No, he knows he's going to get it for that, and I thought it was brave to toward both of them. But, Cammy, your thoughts? Um, it, it's a penalty um, Clue is a penalty I applaud Strider For not uh, taking the centre half's union There of saying that You know it, it was an awkward ball And you know all that It was The the, the, the position of the cross coming in uh, Does make it really awkward for him to deal with 
Um, he's forced to, to go into that body movement that we've discussed in terms of leaning in. His arm, you can't really say his arms are in a natural position because it's as by his side as it could possibly get. But he has to deal with that ball because Morelos is behind him, albeit Morelos has been marked. Um, but he has to deal with it. So he deals with it in pretty much the only way he can. Um, and again, totally agree with Alex. He, 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 very, very brave refereeing to give that decision because I think against Rangers it's easy not to give. Absolutely. That's not that's not a conspiracy. It's none to do with any paranoia, shite or whatever else as well. But I don't think even the most you know simplistic of fans would argue against the fact that we have seen horrendous refereeing decisions given against us in the last 18 to 24 months. And that would have been a very simple one not to give. Um, and I think for me, good good decision. Um, pretty much as, as, as stonewall as you can get in terms of when you see it from the angle coming in from, I think it was Kandias that put the ball in. Mm. Um, but from that angle, very straightforward to give. Uh, Dallas is obviously not got that uh, eye, eye line but again very straightforward so I'm not full credit to the referee for doing his job there So he told me in the lodge on Saturday night that he had this one so he's been very careful with awarding penalties lately to make sure that he had one in the tank so I knew he'd be alright Tav steps up and does what he does um, someone a Rangers player showing testicles in the right manner um, as, as he shows balls to smash into the top corner a la Harry Kane and Alex that's the first deviation from the script and that I thought changed the entire mood of everyone because so far we'd seen this game before um, we'd seen Rangers away from home not playing well, not capitalising on a lead and then team coming at them towards the end getting the goal we'd seen all that, what we hadn't seen was Rangers then going and getting it back now. To be fair, a couple of the late performances, it, it was the last kick of the ball stuff. We couldn't have, but then all of a sudden it was like, ah, right, that we've actually broken this pattern, we've broken this spell, and we just surged forward from then on in. Yeah, the last couple of seasons I've been made to look like an idiot numerous times uh, by drawing upon my ever optimistic nonsense view. Um, of our setbacks happen in games, Rangers tend to turn them round, which we did for a long time. Uh, but the last couple of seasons, we haven't. Uh, the amount of times that we've dropped a goal, went away from home and uh, went 1 0 down, or even at home, uh, seen us go 1 0 down under Warburton or Kashinya or Murti, and I've just been sitting there thinking, we'll get the finger out eventually. And then it's 80 minutes, and I'm like, God, ah, we'll get the finger out eventually. <laughs> um, you know, like, like that sort of thing. Or, too often I've been caught out with that, just, you know, that kind of optimism of, well, look, you know, this happens. I've seen great angel sides have to do this stuff before a sort of thing happens. And it was nice to see that we have that this season, um, or we seem to have that this season. Uh, well, away form, we know it was becoming a thing, but the Aberdeen game we were unlucky not to win, the Motherwell game we were unlucky not to win, in the way the games went, you know, the circumstances of how we dropped those points were well, excellent away to Kilmarnock Cup. So really the Livingston one was the one that stood out because we were just abject on the day. Had this finished one each, it would have been exactly the same. We didn't play that well, but that last ten minutes till we went to one each and actually just got the park and, and you know, put some real pressure on. I think that's the difference. How many times have you watched this in the past couple of years when mm. we've been chasing a game and we don't even get a shot to go mm. for 10, 15 minutes at yeah. the end? No, Never mind 100%. 100%. Um, I, I was panicking, I admit, and then when that goal went in, it, it just seemed to free them. Alfredo Morelos then wins another penalty. I thought it was a stonewaller, Cami, the boy. Gets wrong side, just compounding a bad couple of minutes for him. Again, as he had tried with the first one of the, I'll do this, and then if the ref says anything, I'll say it was an accident. He runs across the back of him, clips him. You clearly see in the replay his knee goes into Alfie's thigh. The ref's in a great position and he awards the penalty. I thought it was a stonewaller. Was it? Yeah, it was, yeah, absolutely. And again, full marks to the referee because his positioning was key to that element of it. Um, again, you can see from where the camera position is, same thing as the first penalty, because you're looking down the line, you can see his penny com comes across him. He hits what I think is his left foot, which goes into the, the back of his right thigh, uh, impedes him, penalty. Interesting, however, that uh, one defender can give away two penalties and not receive a caution, 
little bit different, but hey ho. Um, I thought the second the, the one was a penalty. Uh, I, I wouldn't have booked him for the first one, but I did think the second, he, he knows exactly what he's doing there. Uh, actually, he doesn't because it's fucking stupid. Let him go um, and have the shot. You never know, take your chance. But uh, yeah, up step. T- now, hands up, or rather verbally say, because it's a podcast and people can't see your hands. Thankfully, a lot of the weeks when we're talking about Stephen Gerrard, for me anyway. Um, who thought Tav had missed it? Because he's put it dead centre, literally dead centre, so much so that it hits the stanchion at the back and comes straight back out. And at first, I thought the keeper had got his leg to it. On TV, yeah, yep. yeah it definitely looked that way, didn't it? It was only when Tav was celebrating, I thought, nah, he wouldn't celebrate if I hadn't gone in. <laughs> you know, he'd, he'd look like a dick. <laughs> if he was... It would to me. It reminded me a little bit of the Ajaria goal, where obviously the keeper gets a touch in it, but you you think he's he's kind of just sent in unimpeded. Um, but yeah, when you see it from different angles, I could look a bit uh, misleading. The thing I would say on in terms of just just very quickly about uh, Tavernier's penalties are that um, the reason why this is the best football podcast I've ever lived is because we are incredibly fair in terms of our assessment, especially regarding our own players, and we were very, very critical of Tavernier when we were talking about the Motherwell game and the fact that he cost us two points in that game. On Sunday, he won us two points. Yep. And that shows the balls that he had to step up to that. Now, I don't think necessarily to tell him this because obviously from a confidence perspective, but this is where things like that will even themselves out over the season um, where he does have the, the, the fortitude to step up for that. And I think... For me, this solidifies the reason to make him captain. Um, I'm not, listen, I'm going to say this. I am not a huge fan of defenders taking penalties. I really am not. But as long as he continues that awesome scoring streak, he can take as many as he wants. But I will say, from a character perspective, um, that is absolutely a validation of making him captain. And hopefully, when he does make mistakes, the like of which he did at Fur Park, he can then say, well, no, I'm contributing to other areas of this, the, uh, to, to, to the league and getting points. He definitely is, as is Alfredo Morelos, who, in the last minute, um, brings up my coupon. So thank you very much, 16 to 1, that'll do. And uh, I'll be honest, 83 minutes, I didn't see 4, or 80 minutes, I didn't see 4-1 coming up. But that's exactly what did happen when uh, Daniel Candace and him streak through together at, at full speed which was great to see breaking the neck to get there the Hamilton goalkeeper who God love him I think is the worst in the division he kind of goes to come out stops changes his mind runs out does get to the ball before uh, Daniel Candace but only knocks it straight to Alfie who just takes it in his stride runs in and smacks it home uh, which was a, a great finish because he, he doesn't have time to turn around and look he's just got to hit it and he, he absolutely exits it into the top corner Um Alfredo Morelos, uh, at, at times at the start of the season, was a bit disappointing, but I think for the last month in particular, has been outstanding every game. And even yesterday when Alex, I didn't think he, he got service. I thought he was let down by his midfield in an offensive uh, sense. But he worked hard, and his contribution to the match finishes up at one assist, one goal, one penalty, one. Um, that's top class, that's top draw stuff. Um, yeah, just just before I go into that, because I, I fully agree there, uh, something I've kind of talked about before, but their goalkeeper making that poor decision for the fourth goal has come from him making the poor decision for the first goal, where he's come out and been caught out. So he's going to come out, he suddenly remembers he's already made an arse of one of those in the game, and he hesitates, and that's what's you know, led to him. When he should have been out to the edge of his box in that one. Yeah. When Morelos played the pass, I thought, oh, that's a little bit heavy. And then I was surprised he didn't move, uh, you know. Yeah, but you but, and I watched, because you know, research purposes, we watched Hamilton last match against Hibs, and he was fucking terrible in yeah, that one as well. He looks pretty poor. Yeah, he, he does, is. yes. Um, it's, I actually thought the last couple of seasons, the standard of goalkeepers in Scottish football was getting a little bit better than I remember it being when I was younger. It always seemed to be a howler of three. Um, he's uh, he looks like he's fitting right into the old tradition, doesn't he? There is there is that saying though, Alex, of he who hesitates probably plays in goals at the Cannabis Oil Arena. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Actually, him and Nico true, at the yeah. him and Nico at the back with a bong commiserating each other afterwards <laughs> and said we, prob- we probably shouldn't have done this at five two, you know. Um, yeah, but- just like oh dude, <laughs> exactly. yeah. you know, I feel so sorry um, for you, man. Yeah, <laughs> but 
But um, on Morelos, uh, to me, his style of striking, uh, the type of player he is, is exactly what Rangers need. He could have, and many other past strikers would have, strolled about up front, taking the huff and not getting any service. We have seen plenty of players like that. And some of those players are great at scoring goals, or were great, sorry, at scoring goals, better goal scorers than Morelos, but they wouldn't have affected that game yesterday the way that he did. He was pressing, he was harrying, he was forcing mistakes. Out of their defenders, the last goal was, that was a cracking finish. The more you look at it, it's on his weaker foot. He's passed through to Ken. He's on his weaker foot as well. He's won that penalty. He's been hovering about for the ball to tap in for the other penalty. All of this, when, when our team's not playing well, we've had strikers in the past who will take the excuse of just doing some doggies up front, you know, just mm. running between a couple of defenders and getting annoyed because I'm not seeing the ball. Relos just doesn't do that. Even in his games where he's poor, he's still making an impact. He's still leaving a mark in defenders. He's still making it difficult to be, you know, shut out of the game. And right now, the past, I think you're right, the past month or so, the, the improvement in him, this isn't just a guy who's in good form. This is a guy who has improved his level. Uh, and I'm sure over the course of the season, he'll have little dips or his confidence might go a little bit or whatever it happens. But his base level now is higher than it was at the start of this season. He's, he's making some really, really big improvements. No, totally. And, and like I say, I think that, you know, sometimes at the start of the season, he, he, we got the bad Alfredo, but lately, and it's now a sustained period of form, incidentally, it's not one or two games. Um, he's been tremendous. Can I, can I just come in with that? I think there's a couple of points I just want to touch on really quickly, David, if I can, because yep. I'm kind of conscious of time and what have you. Um, the first thing is, um, I'm a big believer that you fix your roof when the sun is shining. So to allude to Alex's point, when you're then got Alfredo Morelos in this kind of form, this is when you sit him down and you say, look, we man, when we're dealing with your temperament, when things aren't going well, this is why you know you contribute in so many ways that that goal was the icing on top of the cake, but it was completely unnecessary because by and large you've won us two penalties and you've set up the first goal exactly as Alex says. So don't worry that if you don't score or whatever else happens because look at how much you're contributing. There was a point to me, and maybe I don't know if I maybe imagine this or not when I was watching um, watching the game back. But after the second penalties awarded, did Morelos look to see if he could take it? I don't know. Did he? Did either of you say? I don't know. I, I thought that the camera went to him, and I don't know if he's looking at the bench and he's kind of just uh, gesticulating as if you know, can I hit it? I don't. And then obviously I, I, gives, I, it, Cammy, gives it to Tavi. Cammy, I don't have a problem with a striker that wants to score goals, I, and I don't. He, he didn't make a thing of it. I mean, asking. I don't. No, I, I don't, I don't yeah, see that. That's, no, 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 no. And, and that's the that's the point I'm illustrating is that if he did do that, and again, I don't know if, if you know listeners can can validate that or not. But if he did do that, then. I'm really pleased that he did because firstly he's got the hunger to score it yeah. himself because that's what he wants to do and secondly it didn't let it affect him because you saw how he busted his arse to not only try and set up Candace but then also to do the follow up mm. so again this is where we're, we've mentioned so many times about his temperament about his attitude and everything else as well but see when he's on, on form like this that guy is unplayable he is an absolute game changer and this is where I'd sit him down and go look mate this is the contract that we've given you this is the love that the fans have for you when you're like this as well this is why you need to remember this, that even if things aren't going well for you, we know it will come back. And that's what we need to reinforce for him at the moment. Because again, like you say, the guy, I think reading stats, he is eight goals behind Dembele at the moment. I mean, obviously our Scottish media will not turn around and say that he's worth £50 million because he's a Rangers player. But that's how valuable this guy is. And not just in goals, in, in assists as well. No, he's not any good in goals. I think. Yeah, no, he's not good in goals, but he's good at scoring goals. Oh, yeah, right, sorry. I just thought, you know, third choice behind... Maybe he is behind uh, well, uh, Alan well, and Well, I've seen some videos of him in training doing okay that way. Oh, but there, you <laughs> go. there you go, then. Uh, just one last thing, sorry, just on this. Uh, in terms of temperament, I think we're seeing a difference there as well because that game yeah. was two minutes old and someone tried to do him. Oh, that we uh, uh, Scott, yeah, Scott Brown look alike Well, he done that as well. What the... the as well. Right, yeah. Of all the footballers in world history that you could choose to try and style yourself on, and you shouldn't anyway because it's sad, right? If you're a professional player, you should be trying to carve your own niche, not not be a replica of somebody else. But even then you decide to do that. Scott Brown, a guy who looks like a turnip, has had an unfortunate incident with a hairdryer. He is 
absolutely ridiculous. And of course, you know, he was trying to get Alfie wound up, spat at his feet at one point, tried to break, and, and Morelos just walked away and got booked for being Morelos, of course. Yeah, 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 it was good to see that. I think someone pointed out a few weeks ago that he seems to spend a bit more time in the deck after a sore one uh, instead of jumping up and, you know, having a go at whoever's hit him. I don't know if that's a deliberate tactic he's been told to do. Uh, he just seems to me that he's not quite as confrontational. I don't think you'll ever get it right out of his game. I think it's just the way that he is. It was interesting to hear Joe Worrell before the game on BT Sport talk about how, you know, he wouldn't want to be stuck in a left way. He's an angry little man. I see he's an angry little man, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't think we'll ever get that out of him completely, but we seem to have found a way to manage it a bit more. Um, we're not seeing too much. And, and, and the problem he's got is obviously that even the smallest sign of petulance from him becomes a, a bookable offence in the referees up here. That's just the reputation he's got, sadly. But uh, I think there was, you know, yesterday there was some real tangible signs of improvement there. Because had he turned around and smacked somebody 25 minutes into the game after some of the fouls he was taking, probably wouldn't have blamed him. No. So, so, you know, um, he's, got, uh, he's definitely got a bit better at handling that in recent weeks as well. So a good win, not a great performance, but we'll take that. We needed the win more than we needed anything else yesterday. And uh, on we go to Thursday night, Spartak Moscow at home. And they're not in the best of health themselves, sitting seventh in their league and have in fact just sacked their manager, Massimo Carrera. Uh, interestingly enough, the second time that a club have sacked their manager this season before coming to Ibrox in the Europa League, the Villarreal manager must be shitting himself. So, Cami, we had two games this week. And strangely, much as I'm looking forward to this one, this is just a personal thing, this isn't the biggest one of the two of them for me. But a win here, and we're capable of it, certainly, we're in a really, really good place to get out of this group. And then, let's be honest, ludicrously, Rangers, from starting their uh, European campaign before last season finished, could be in Europe after Christmas. I think we. there's a few points to that. The first thing is, I totally agree with you, it's not the biggest game um, of this week. Um, the biggest game is the League Cup semi-final, and not because it's against Aberdeen, who are non-entities. I think we potentially could win the group. I don't think it's just a question of kind of qualifying out of it, um, because we've shown that we can perform at this level. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of it now. Um, you're right, we you know started this European campaign um, I think it was just after Walter Smith left the first time around. Um, and we're just constantly, you know, showing these incremental improvements. And um, for me, it's uh, it's going to be a great test. And it should be a great test because um, I want to take us into that semi-final off the back of a good, solid performance against a team who, yes, they're faltering at the moment, but they're not mugs. No, and I, no, no, no. No, I think, I think, like you say, we can go in against them um as, as slight favourites. Now, if you were to say to me, you know, that's a real possibility, uh, the last week in October, um, when we were playing European qualifiers in June, then, you know, I, I, I would have looked to see which leg you were pulling. But, in actual, you know, in, in all honesty, we're saying this from a position of confidence now. Um, and it's confidence that's been earned. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, blind. It's not Alex's usual amount of, you know, blind optimism, which we all love him for. It's truth. And no, I'm, I'm I'm really excited over the next couple of games. Alex, Spartak are a good side technically, but like you know the the cliche, but there's a German truth in it. Like a lot of Russian sides, they maybe don't travel uh, very well, although very very difficult to beat at home. It's it's a real good opportunity for us here. I mean, Ibrox is going to be packed. The atmosphere is going to be brilliant. Uh, it, like the Rapid game, where it's kind of like a free hit for the fans. So there's not really. I noticed there wasn't the grumbling that goes on because people were just so... They maybe didn't have that, you know, desperation that we've had to, to get a trophy, to get the to get 55, that of course has happened because of what's happened to the last few years. It was just a much more upbeat and positive atmosphere and I expect it to be the same on Thursday night. Yeah, I think it will be. Um, although I think it will be slightly tempered by the fact that uh, you know, people have made a bit of a deal out of the fact that, that Vienna beat Spartak in the first game of the group. Again, Vienna were at home, Spartak away from home, not playing well. Uh, their European record recently, I think someone told me it was two wins from the last 12. 
or something like that for for Spartak Moscow. Uh, the um, yeah, it represents a really good opportunity. But my my thing always is you just assume that your opponents are going to be at their best, even if they haven't been for you know weeks. As as is, is the case with Moscow, they haven't. They've been leaking a lot of goals, and they you know they're not playing anywhere near as strong as they were two years ago with a very similar squad. You still got to assume that they might do it on the night, and I. I'm of the opinion that we would need to be even better than we were against Rapid Vienna to beat Spartak at their best. Um, so that's, you know, I think that's where I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing just how our players approach that. Uh, how we, how we do, you know, do, do they feel as though they need to step up? Mm. Do they have a step up in them? Because if they do, that would be lovely to watch. <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> you know, uh, but that night against Vienna, the second half especially, there was some outstanding stuff played and, um, and you know, if, if we can be even better than that again, that would be brilliant to see. Uh, so, because of all of that, I, I'm obviously I agree with you guys. It's the, the League Cup semi final is the more important game. But if I'm honest, I'm slightly more excited by the Spartak Moscow match, just because it's a little bit more unknown. I can understand. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, look, it's while it is more important to what we want to do and who we are and whatnot. It's fucking Aberdeen, you know. All due respect, Um, this is different. This is the kind of stuff we've missed for so long, and it's exciting. So now I'm very much looking forward to it as well. Can't wait to get to Ibrox for it. Now, just before we wrap up for today, just time to award this week's uh, Total Hartson Award. That's when someone in the world of sport has made such an arse of themselves over the past week or so that uh, you could only compare it to the stupidity shown by that of the former Wales and Celtic striker and, and say to them, oh mate, you've made a Total Hartson of that. So, first up is Alex. Okay, now, uh, like myself, David, you're a fan of good old WWE. Yes. yes. So, if you read a storyline about someone who was who had broken a driver's jaw and then hit a government official over the head with a chair, you would instantly thought, ah, Vince is pulling out the old storylines, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In this case, no, that is um, Alexander Cochran oh. of Zen- St. Petersburg fame and uh, a guy who plays... Um, in Russia as well, by the name of Mamiev, who on the 7th of October um, decided to celebrate our outstanding win against Hearts by going out and, and battering people. Um, they have been accused of breaking the driver, the driver of a journalist's jaw, Oof. and they are on video smashing a chair over the head of a civil servant. And let me just get his job here, because this one really does confuse me. Um, I had it in front of me yet. The Ministry of in- Industry and Trade. Now, I'm curious as to what happens with the Ministry Ministry of Industry and Trade that winds up a footballer <laughs> enough to pick up a chair and rattle him. Um, two personal favourite bits with this are the Russian Premier League saying there is no place for hooligans the Russian Premier League yeah, but, uh, saying there is no place for hooligans. Um, Maybe they mean yeah, on the pitch rather than in the stands where in Russia there definitely yeah, appears yeah, to be yeah, room for hooligans. Um, and secondly, there was pictures on social media today of Alexander Cochrane posing with his uh, handcuffs on as though it was some sort of new watch or something like that. Genuinely, got a smile on his face, he's posing there with the handcuffs like to say, look at this, this is dead funny as he then finds out he's spending another two months in a Russian jail before his trial. Um, Ooh, yeah, was, is he? Yeah, yes. He's got, him and the other player have been uh, detained for a further two months, and if found guilty, could face a sentence of up to five years. I'd imagine two months in a Russian jail is fucking yeah. bad enough. So, Do bribes um, mean yeah. nothing now in Russia? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, what's obviously, changed? They, obviously they didn't pull enough money out there, or, you know... I think that government official was just one too many. Yeah, maybe it's maybe he's a good yeah. pal of Putin's or something. But yeah, I would, I would like to say that they've made a, a total hearts in that situation. It's going to be hard to beat, Cammy. It will be, but <clears throat> I always like to keep uh, my hearts in local, um, as I'm sure uh, you know has never been said before. <laughs> um, and my hearts in the week is, is going to have to be Stevie Thompson, um, who. 
I, I'm, I'm nominating because it's a really straightforward, very simplistic choice, and for that, I apologise. But I feel the quantity um, of the Hartsons involved in this scenario. So, yeah, so Stevie Thompson decided that he wanted to do an interview uh, with a very well-known journalist. However, not well-known for his own quality because it was Hart and Hand's uh, favourite son, Graham Spears. As it turns out, however, the uh, journalistic etiquette means that because Stevie Thompson already had a column within uh, the Herald, that typically what would happen is the Times would contact the Herald to say, look, we want to interview him, etc. We want to be able to do this. And there's a little bit of kind of professional courtesy, if you will. Um, now, the reason as to why there's a number of Hartsons involved within this is because Stevie decided that he would do an interview with Graham Spears. That's Hartson number one. Mm-hmm. Um, because Graham is, let's face it, probably one of the worst journalists that's ever, you know, come out of the, 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 the Scottish print media. Um, he is a systemic failure on everything that he touches. Um, Stevie came out and did an interview, which basically it was alluded that he um, had very little time for actually watching football, which you know put his position in sports scene at risk. Um, but better than that, he also didn't bother uh, contacting um, Stevie's paper before he then decided to to, to run the uh, run the article. So Stevie Thompson was sacked by the Herald as a columnist of their own. Um, told his uh, his football input was not required any longer. Um, so having done an interview with a continually failing journalist, uh, painting him in a really really bad light from his main uh, job in the BBC, he's now lost another job as a result of that um, ludicrous decision. So uh, yeah, straightforward choice, but really just because of the amount of unglaring Hartsons that followed Stevie Thompson's thought process there. Well, uh, I, that's a good one, and yeah, I mean, daft bastard. Uh, basically what happened, folks, is that in the interview, Stephen Thompson said, I watch um, around about 60 games a week, and in fact, on a Saturday when I'm in at BBC Studios, I watch all six Premier League matches, sometimes a First Division one, and then joked, football's never on in my house, uh, I don't actually like football. And Spears left out the bit about the 60 games and left out the bit about it being a joke and instead used that as the headline of his article and thus completely done him, uh, done him up, you're right. So hopefully he learns. Guy's poison, don't go near him, um, is the only uh, advice you can take. Mine's is a heart and hand favourite, former patron saint of heart and hand, Gigi Bacali. Uh, he's back now. Now, he owns F- FCSB, which is what Stoyer uh, became under his, his watch and he's just said that his driver will become the team's next coach after he gets his coaching badges. The man is a former player, he used to be brilliant with the ball at his feet but hasn't managed anyone at senior level and currently works as Bacali's PA and driver. When asked, Bacali said, I don't see why he's not as good as any of the other idiots that I've had here in the past. He'll be able to do the job. He takes instruction well. He's a believer. So... DJ up to his old tricks again. I suppose it's a matter of time before he names himself anyway. But no, uh, two months in a Russian jail. I'm going to have to go for Alexander Corcoran. So congratulations, Alex. Uh, you need to phone Alexander Corcoran and tell him, mate, you've made a total hearts and all of it. <laughs> okay, folks, thank you very much for joining us this week. Uh, if you want to hear more from us, you'll be able to find lots more uh, over on our Patreon site, which is patreon.com forward slash heart and hand. There's also daily content goes up on our website, heartandhand.co.uk. Thanks to our executive producers in London, Mr. Knightley and Paul Miles, and thanks to my two guests, Alexander Staff. Thank you, gentlemen. Cameron James Bell. A pleasure as always, boys. We'll be back on Friday because obviously we're playing Thursday night with uh, the reaction to the Spartak game and a look ahead to the sheet match. Until then, have a great week. Speak soon. Bye.